And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me, I have a returning good brother to the temple. Crit, last time we had him on, he, he was on the cusp of creating his game, his first entry in his game book. Series so Wanderer, um, Stormwing. Now he's br now he's back, bet bigger and better than ever with the Iron Uprising, the second book in in the Wanderer series. The one and only Jacob D C Ross. How are you doing today, man? I'm fantastic. How are you, Mildred? I am do I am doing good. Um, it's been it's been a it's been a wild few months since the last time I ha last time I had you in these hallowed halls. Yes, um, it has. Sorry. And so, for, so um, first off, first off, can um, congratulations on get on getting um, Wanderer out there. Well, thank um, you. Which I sh which I did I uh, did note. Um, I I certainly had I certainly had my f my fair share of fun with it. Um, Especially since it helped, especially since it helped me kind of dive back into the rabbit hole of um, game books, which I hadn't I hadn't delved into for quite a bit up until up until that point. Um, okay. When it now when it comes to when it come when it came to the development of it, because I want to go into a bit of a some a bit of post mortem discussions about um, Stormwing before we delve into the Iron Uprising. Okay. Um, well, first off, um, what was the reasoning for going with the black and white dice approach that you utilized? Uh, black and white because you do uh, extra color gets mm -hmm. you more data that you can uh, pack into one roll. Mm -hmm. uh, I like it's again more of a an Asian thing, but to me, white is the boring color, and in Asian cultures. White is the color of death and decay, mm -hmm. so the black dye is is the positive dye in my system. Yep. Uh, the Star Wars D six does it with the the wild dye, mm -hmm. uh, something similar. Um, Chin, a, a Chinese themed Chin, the Warring States. Yeah. Yep, they do it with a black and white thing. Um, feng Shui, Feng Shui. Yep, and then I've. I've done it too with a previous system of mine uh, called uh, Wave Man. Yep. And then Tiago Jungus does it with Ronin, mm -hmm. and I'm sure other people do it. But yeah, I I just like being able to get uh, more info out of one set of rolls. So just one more variable to toss in there. Mm -hmm. I I can de I can definitely get that. Now when it comes now um. Uh, now, obviously, um, Wanderer and Wanderer, um, so, um, game. Well, so I should refer. I should rephrase it. Stormwing, since Wanderer is the name of the whole is the whole series. Um, right. When it came. When it came to the when it came to the approach that you um, that you went that you went with, what were, what were some of the learning experiences that you took that you took away from developing that first book? Well, um, getting my act together publishing wise, uh, let me see some, some good lessons to learn from it were, uh, f formatting, mm -hmm. uh, and really, really having a solid theme, um, it was it was a good experience because during that Kickstarter, I had had some feedback from the backers mm -hmm. to where there there was a bit in the book that wasn't there when I started the campaign, and uh, I'm I'm happy that it <laughs> that it went in because it's the whole uh, Blood Shaper faction wasn't present at first, so. Mm -hmm. You know, and then just tight plotting. I guess you learn a bit more of that. Mm -hmm. But 
Um, yeah, I guess that's what I say. Yeah. Now, obviously, up up until that point, I had no, I had known you mo- mainly for your RPG works, um, right? Kai, Kaigaku, Exodus, and um, so and so on. Um, okay. What given given the given the writing differences, what were what would be some of the things you say you had? To, what were some of the habits you had to work out of um, when it came when it came to writing from writing um, RPGs to writing a game book? Uh, overly verbose. Uh, you don't have as much space in the text to to work with mm-hmm. because you've got to convey a lot of information in a little bit of space because uh, otherwise you'll just eat up your page count. Mm-hmm. So it's a, it's a bit of a tug of war between providing uh, sensory detail in each entry while also maintaining uh, uh, terseness or not terseness succinctness. Mm-hmm. Would you would you say it's a case where you where um where you need to have less is more as your personal mantra? Yep, absolutely. I'm a I'm a big firm believer too in the power of no. Every writer needs someone telling them no for their bad ideas, and I've got plenty. Mm-hmm. Um. Well, with that, were there were there any speaking of bad ideas? Were there were there any idea? Were there any ideas that you had ha- you had had at the st- at the start, but you um, but as Stormwing was developing, you had to tell yourself this isn't going to work. It's be- It's best to drop it. Yeah, uh, there were a few uh, bits with the um, the talents at the beginning, and I, I actually simplified it quite a bit. Mm-hmm. Just I didn't want to bog everything down all at once so i ended up uh, cutting a couple of the talents which i'm gonna put back in Mm -hmm. in a book that makes more sense for them what i needed to do with stormwing was focused mainly on the bare bones of the system because it while it was a game book it was also a proof of concept for the whole line and so i needed to keep it simple and iconic as opposed to bloated which makes it definitely makes sense um yeah. now the now stormwing came down to uh to 144 pages when you were writing it did you have it did you have a um hard line um maximum as far as how many pages you were gonna go i wasn't gonna go more than like 150 mm-hmm. uh, just I didn't want again. I'm big against page count bloat for the sake of page count bloat. It just it bothers me when people. I shouldn't say bother me, but it just goes against my personal ethos because you want things to be accessible to people, and increasing your page count unnecessarily also makes things cost more for consumers. And I don't want anyone to have to pay more to read a book than they need to which that makes that makes sense now when it now when it comes to now um when it when it comes to the when it comes to the ne- the next book in the series the iron uprising okay. now for now first off um the one, the one thing that I noticed is that it's, is that Stormwing was Stormwing was kind of on the sword and sorcery end end of the spectrum. Yes. Um, and the Iron Uprising is I'd I'd say is leaning more in the leaning more in the science fan. Would you say it leans more into the science fantasy end of things? Um, it gets closer to it. I. Uh, it's got the visual trappings mm-hmm. of. Uh, steampunk, I'd say, but mm-hmm. I, I'm putting in more of the attitude of a cyberpunk, the social dystopia, um, fighting the status quo, that mm-hmm. sort of thing. Yeah. Uh, so it's yeah, it's tonally it's it's pretty different. Yeah. Um, I will I will admit that when I saw the protagonist um, Snorty, 
I I immediately started nicknaming him Mega Dwarf. <laughs> I'm sure you're not the only one. <laughs> look, look, it's a look, it's a suit of armor with a can with a cannon arm. I couldn't help myself. That's I I mean there there's some thematic inspiration from there. Mm -hmm. Um I'll say when whenever you beat a boss, you can choose the order you take the bosses mm -hmm. um, non-linearly, and when you do, you get to take their weapon and add it to your suit. Yeah. Um, so it's mm -hmm. it wears its inspiration on its sleeve. Yeah. With that kind of thing in mind, would you would you say that um, with Stormwing kind of kind of being the, for lack of a better term, pilot for the Wanderer series? Would the Iron Uprising be your, be your attempt to um, expand the sandbox that you developed? Yeah, it's uh, it's set in the same universe, and there's mm -hmm. some character cameos in it. Um, but it's not a proper sequel. No, no, I uh, I get the feeling that you that even though all even though the Wanderer books are going to be set in the same universe, they're not a chronological affair. No, uh, yeah, no. There's none of it's. It's pretty nonlinear mm -hmm. because I've, I'm trying to um, keep it to where people, if they're going to be writing their own adventures for it mm -hmm. or making their own scenarios, you you can't establish a very strong canon because I don't want to contradict anyone else. Uh, there's there's going to be book four is going to be a direct sequel, but again, you know, the character Stormwing is always going to be uh, undefined as far as their true gender and skin color and all that. Mm -hmm. So I can't go too far into the past with it, but there is going to be an expansion of the story and exploring some of the villain factions. Yeah. Um, when I, I, um, I do recall when I when I would discuss um, Stormwing with some with some of the people in the temple. I had de I described a lot. I described a lot of the characters, a lot of the um, protagonist in it, and what we have for the for the Iron Uprising is kind is kind of feeling the way um, the way the the way a silent protagonist would work in a um, in a video game RP in an early days video game RPG. Yeah, Storm. Um... <laughs> In my head, for my Stormwing, Stormwing is Link. <laughs> um, so I get what I get that feeling. I mm -hmm. I may have uh, put that in there. <laughs> yeah, I was I wasn't even I wasn't even using um, Stormwing as my example. I was I was using the I was using the hero in the uh, Dragon Quest series. Oh, okay. So it's not too far, it's not too far off. Although it although it kind of breaks the rules because at the end of the first game in Dragon Quest, the hero um, has one line, which is one more than than Link has had in tw in 25 years, so make of that what you will. <laughs> right. Um, but when it comes... But when it comes... When it comes to the whole... When it comes to the... Um, when it comes to the features within. Now... I know, given given how we've made the Mega Man jokes a few times, um, was there a temptation to put some sort of rock paper scissors ap approach within the uh, within the sandbox? Uh, okay, so <laughs> um, here, okay, so here's the structure of the book, mm -hmm. and you tell me if it sounds familiar, All right. but. You get your suit, mm -hmm. and yeah, you get to choose the order in which you face the first three bosses. And the weapons that drop from each of the boxes make bosses makes a specific boss fight easier if you have that weapon for the next one. <laughs> um, so, yeah, <laughs> I mean, you did I, look. You did say that you wore the influence on its sleeve. Yeah. So. It's, I can't, so I can't, I can't exactly fault you for true, for truth and advertising. <laughs> yeah. It's, mm -hmm. it's pretty Mega Man-y. 
Yeah. Um, now, give, now taking that into account, um, now within within the die system, of course, um, five 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 and sixes are are the lucky numbers to try and to try and succeed. Um, right. Which me, which means that success typically has a forty percent um, chance when you're not when you're not factoring in um, mo- when you're not factoring in advantage, disadvantage, or or the like. Um, what? Why go? Why go with um that? Why go with that percentage specifically? Especially since a lot of people have the have the math approach where a bit where a baseline a baseline action should have a fifty per, a fifty fifty shot a lot of times. Uh, it was hard to do it with two dice. Um, mm-hmm. That's pretty much why. Uh, just because if if I was going to do, you know, four and up, I, mm-hmm. which was my first consideration, it's that increases the odds significantly. And I thought it was closer to um, <laughs> to baseline 50 than it was. Mm-hmm. But in Stormwing, um, the different talents you have, I try to make it pretty easier. And I've even told people, uh, if you... And I'm going to actually put a note in, in the rules of Iron Uprising. But if you want to make it a little easier... Um, just increase the damage you do in your rolls by uh, the number of successes that you get. Mm-hmm. Uh, I was reading Ian Livingston, who co-created Fighting Fantasy, mm-hmm. and someone said someone had asked him, "What's your strategy for such and such book?" And he said, "I cheat." <laughs> <laughs> and you know, I mean, he had to because they make him so hard. And the other thing I had thought about with it is because. You've got infinite replays mm-hmm. on these books, so it felt like uh, doing. Um, uh, sorry, can't speak right. But it felt like doing things just a little harder because you've got the book right there and can pick it up right away again mm-hmm. isn't gonna become too much of a of a problem. Yeah, that makes, that makes sense. sense. Now. What now? Um, given the fact that given the fact that the Iron Uprising is is impl- is implied to be longer, is is this going to be over one hundred and fifty pages? Is what is what you're shooting for? It's yeah. So I've got the book pretty much written out. Mm-hmm. Um, I have a few more sections to do in the finale, but it's basically just scripting out the final boss battle. Yeah. Um, the solo game rule section at the end, I'm lifting most of the text from Stormwing. I'm going to try and keep that consistent among the books because mm-hmm. it felt to me a little like self-plagiarism, but at the same time, I don't want someone to have to get every single book just to have the basic rules. Mm-hmm. Um, I want it to be standalone-ish. And I'll get I'll get your question about that, um, the page count, but the... Uh, the the back section is going to have a different set of assumptions. The rules and the tables will be the same, but some of the parts will be geared towards uh, this story a little more and going back and forth between the books if you want. But mm-hmm. the current page, the draft as it stands, it it's looking to be that it might even be about double the the length, the page count of the book. Um, I've got 127 sections, uh, as opposed to there were a total of, if you count the prologue, 101 or 100 in the last one. And this boss fight plus tying up some loose ends, it probably gonna, it's probably going to put it at about 150 sections. Um, the other thing about that is that it... It's different because there's a if if you remember in Stormwing there's a section mm-hmm. where you can go out into the wilderness and random have random encounters and it takes you a few times out to find the bandits hideout or find the giants uh, cave. 
in this one, I've got a similar uh, mechanic about recurring encounters. So it kind of makes it a little longer than you think. I, I know that a typical uh, fighting fantasy book is 350 sections. Mm-hmm. And they map it out usually at about 80 to, to win. Mine, you're you're going to go down most of them. Mm-hmm. There are a few that you're not going to, and there's there are some sub quests that you might not find. Uh, but I've got a section where have you ever played Jedi Fallen Order? Yeah, um, okay. I've uh, and um, because of the fact that I cut my teeth way too much on Souls games, I ended up playing that on Master. Okay. <laughs> nice. I I did it mostly mm-hmm. on normal, but I had problems with the seventh sister mm-hmm. or fifth sister. Yeah. Um. But there, you know that part where the bounty hunters start pestering you halfway through. Yeah. So there's bounty hunters that start pestering you. And there's a, a keyword section that I'll say, this is a bounty section. Bookmark your place here. Go see, uh, right now it's section 23, but I'm going to be randomizing everything. I'll say, go see section 23. And you roll two dice. And that shows you uh, who you encounter. Mm-hmm. So it, you do that a few times in the book. So it, it kind of, it does increase its length a bit. Um, mm-hmm. and so it's, it's going to feel a lot longer than like a fighting fantasy book. Um, to, to me, I think more like the lone wolf books where you could pick a path, but you covered a lot of the book each time you played through. Yeah. So, um, and, mm-hmm. yeah. And with with that kind of thing in mind, since we didn't ha- since we didn't have the opportunity to really delve into this the last time I had you on, um, now you've you've mentioned you've you've uh, mentioned and referenced um, Joe Devner, I- Ian Livingstone, and um, and Steve and Steve Jackson. Mm-hmm. Um, now, when it comes when it comes to when it comes to their their particular wor- their particular work um, within ga- within game books, obviously. Something I'm curious about is what what was could you name one thing in say fighting fantasy and lone wolf and and so on that you that you tr- that um that you that you didn't ca- that you didn't care for from your perspective that you wanted to not do with the um wanderer system uh yeah um i I based a lot of it probably more on Lone Wolf, the mm-hmm. inspiration. You know, I mean, Stormwing comes across as a Lone Wolf clone, perhaps. Uh, but both series, you know, they could have, you could have a lot of insta kills, and I don't really have any insta kills in mine. So that's one reason why there's less branching, because a lot of those books. You know, oh, well, you step off the wrong cliff. And some of them were pretty justified, like going into the plane of fire without any protection, you're going to get burnt up. Mm -hmm. But um, I usually just, I I don't put that many in. And then my favorite fighting fantasy is probably Starship Traveler. Uh, I like how they made a group and a crew work and stuff. Mm-hmm. But what I didn't like about that one, have you played that one? Not in a long time. So, you know, you're, you're, it's like Voyager, mm-hmm. except before Voyager. And you got to get back to whatever place you came from. But the problem with it is that there's a specific set of coordinates that mm-hmm. you do that you have to find. And there's nothing in the text to indicate which path is better or which one is worse. There are only three locations. You have to follow one specific golden path 
without any clues being offered as to if you're making a more sound or logical choice. Mm -hmm. And I didn't really care for that because it felt like it was punishing and you would have to play through, you know, 20, 30 times really before you stumbled upon the right answer. And so I... Would you say that qualifies as hand-breaking? Hand-breaking? Hand-breaking, I should... To explain hand breaking is a term that is a term that I use because I needed a polar opposite to hand holding. Um, mm. It's ba- it's basically where you're put you're put in front of an obstacle where the solution is uh, is far too uh, far too obtuse to come across naturally. That the only way you'd come across it is by e- is by either repetition or through foreknowledge. Um, this was a, this was a um, this was the reason why I have a love-hate relationship with a lot of those early point-and-click adventure games that did this that did this kind of thing a lot for some for some yeah. of their puzzles. I I do actually that strikes me very much as handbreaking, mm-hmm. and I I love that book, but it's just that's just one thing that I would change from it. So, mm-hmm. and so with. And when it and when it comes to when it, com- when it comes to the whole the whole thing with um de- with death, I'm ge- I'm I'm guessing I'm guessing that you would rather have it that that um any sort of death in a run with a game book is through th- is through things that are a bit more leg- a bit more legitimate than just than just lol surprise you die. Yeah, I mean. <laughs> I liked it in some of the point and click. I liked in some of the point and click games. If you made like a legitimate stupid decision, mm-hmm. they would kill you right off the bat for it. Um, but I have a problem, and I don't think I'm good enough of a writer to be able to tell someone that you just did something stupid <laughs> if I presented it as an option for for them to take. Uh, usually. I mean, Joe Deaver and Ian Livingstone and Steve Jackson are very good writers, mm-hmm. <laughs> and I'm I'm not their level. Uh, oh. But yeah. Although I do I do remember a lot I do remember a lot of people arguing that it would that um that in in the Lone Wolf books it would carrying around the summer sword is um more is more trouble than it's worth. Oh, cause it, cause you can lose it sometimes. Um, e- either either losing it or um or have or having to de- having to de- having to deal with um surprises that you wouldn't otherwise. Mm. Um, I just re- I just remember that that w- that was an argument I saw at length, uh, plenty plenty of times. Um, now of course now um. When it when it came when it came to the when it came to the system, um, what what was your what was your general guideline that that you had set up when it came to how talents were going to work? I I like in systems where they have a, like weapon system. I like if you're fighting with a weapon, I like mm-hmm. it to feel different. Yeah. Instead of just a numerical bonus. Mm-hmm. And so since this dude starts out fighting, um, I wanted people to be able to have, at least for the first book, the talents really help you discern, uh, get a play style. Like each one should make, make the game feel a little different when you play it. Mm-hmm. Like the one that's more defensive, um, long sword, where you uh, you can penalize the white or get a bonus, you know, to the white die. So some, if you, I don't know, we're just where you're able to change your strategy in combat uh, to where it feels more than just a plus two or a plus one bonus to something. Mm-hmm. Now, and that's that's something I definitely appreciate because. Well, you have you have no idea how how annoyed I've been when when 
when somebody when somebody finally gets that magic sword at the bottom of a dungeon and it's just plus one to attack. Mm -hmm. It's like, really? I what? I broke I broke I broke half of my I broke half of my bones. Half of the party's dead. The other half wishes they were dead, and that and that's it. <laughs> yeah. I yeah I wholeheartedly agree with that. Oh. Um, yeah. Uh, um. I remember during I remember during the during my AD and D days, and um, I I asked around on how somebody would stat Conan's Atlantean sword, and they they just said it's a it's a it's a masterwork bastard sword, and I'm like, that's it. You've got a sword that that was that was in a that was in a temple dedicated to Krom. You'd think it would do more than just that, right? Like a story effect. Yeah. Um, especially, especially since it has written on it, "Suffer no guilt, ye who wills this in the name of Krom." That's such a cool creed. I okay. I, I'm mm -hmm. pretty Conan illiterate. Yeah, but well, that's mm -hmm. actually pretty cool. Well, um, you're you're in good, you're in good territory in that regard because the because the films. Have have very little in common with the um with the books or the uh, comics, um. But I bring I bring that kind of thing up to to um to demonstrate a point. And if I needed to use a more contemporary example, I could use the Master Sword. Okay. Um, like if 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 I was to just write, if I was to just write like some people I've seen some people just write that off using the same rules as a Holy Avenger magic weapon, and I'm thinking. There's there's plenty of holy of the holy Avengers are give are given out like can are given out like candy in D and D campaigns. Mm -hmm. There's only gonna be there's only ever going to be one master sword. Got to right. do got to do a bit better than that. And it lets you time travel. And let's let's you time travel. It is literally called the the blade of evil's bane. And when you've got and when you've got that when you've um. When you've got when you've got that kind of thing, well, there's a there's a reason Chekhov's gun is is a popular phrase among writers and writing critics. If the gun's on the table, it's got it's got to be used. Otherwise, what's the point? I totally agree. Yeah. Um. Now, when. Now, um, was when it came to the whole keyword system. Was that something that you add that you added in, um, or that you added in early on? Uh, yeah, that was mm -hmm. um, pretty integral to it. It's. Have you ever read a game book series? There was like two of them, and they're called Virtual Reality. No, they're from the early '90s, and they've got it. And then there's one called uh, Grail Quest. Where you're like some kid sent on a quest by Merlin, and I think that was the first one to have it, and it's just it works really well yeah. um, with keeping things logically ordered. Mm -hmm. So that's just kind of my thought process yeah. behind it was being able to have events happen and then resolve and then um, kind of act as a logic gate like you would in programming. Mm -hmm. Now, when it, now when it comes to, now when it comes to the, um, the iron, the iron uprising now, Obvi obviously, um, obviously, with some with something like Stormwing, even w even with the multiple weapons, there was and and uh, ways to load out. There was a definite emphasis on melee. Um, yeah. With with um the with the Iron Uprising, obviously, since you've got a cannon for an arm, there's going to be a bit a bit of attention to ranged. How it, how are the mechanics going to be um, reflecting this? Is it mainly just going to be through keywords? Uh, in this particular one, since you're really only wielding the cannon, mm -hmm. um, I went a little simpler 
and it's just there's no distinction between them. Uh, the the bit on the ranged in the melee, that whole section in the first book, and it's going to be present and a little explained because it's I don't make the distinction in Iron Uprising, but that was to help people who um, from a I don't want to say script writing, but from mm -hmm. a script writing perspective of different encounters, uh, how to how to like add flavor to your set pieces mm -hmm. to say if if this were to start out at range, I would do, you know, this. Um, so that's more for, for what it is. It's more, uh, if, or for when you're solo role playing and you, you, you really need to know how something's set up, mm -hmm. but just because an iron uprising, how every single, um, combat you're going to be fighting with your arm cannon. I just had it all be the same. Yeah. Um, and you don't, because you've got your armor, you actually don't have talents in this one, but you start off with a full set of armor. Yeah. Uh, so, and, and then you get some little bits and bobs. And if you happen to run into, um, well, Stormwing mm -hmm. down in the Dwarven City, you can get something else to help you out. Yeah. Now, when it comes now, um, one of the things I was cu I was curious about if you're if you're going to do if you're going to do this because I've seen I've seen um a fair amount of P of PDFs doing this. Have has there been consideration about adding in hyperlinks into the PDF version? Uh, I. Yeah, I'm I'm thinking of doing that. I have bookmarks uh, for each of the headings. They sh mm -hmm. they should be visible um, on the side menu if you're on a PC. Mm -hmm. uh, but I can I can yeah hyperlink this one. It'll be better. And I'm probably going to go back and hyperlink the other one because I've always just liked you know scrolling on the side and clicking. But you're not the first person to mention that to me. <laughs> yeah, it's part of part of the reason I ask is I, I've seen I've seen some people as um pet, as pet projects convert um art, convert art, convert um solo RPG books and game books into into Twine programs and and the like, or oh, okay. or into their or into their own websites and heck I've I've done it for some for for old choose your own adventure books that I, that I have and have on my wall. Um, obviously I'm obviously those kind of things I'm never going to, I'm never going to release. It's just, it's just a case of, I just did it to see if I could actually do it. Right. Um, but what, but, and, and the uh, main, the main reason that, that I had thought about this kind of thing is it's, it's a it's a way to it's a it's a way to help in, help introduce game books to to a new audience that does that doesn't have that attachment to to um page flipping like that. Mm. Yeah, I I'm I'm ADHD mm. legit. I'm not like one of those. Oh, I've got ADHD, but and it can it can bug me, <laughs> yeah. and I completely understand. Yeah. Although um I do although I do I do have to I do have to wag my finger at one at one of the at one of the titles in one se in one section of of, of Stormwing that you called Ratman of Unusual Size. It's <laughs> <laughs> like, gee, I wonder where you got that from. <laughs> yeah. Um, the estate of Esky Alderson, Gelden Stern hasn't come after me, so. <laughs> Well, I think I um, I think I think the I think that estate has has big has big has bigger things to worry about, namely namely the fact that the mere, and this was a heartwarming no, um, moment at moment in internet history, the mere idea that th that there was that there was discussion about doing about doing a reboot of the Princess Bride got everybody angry. <laughs> oh. The audacity! 
that is in, such hubris. Including the entire cast of the original just st- just st- just stepped forward and said no. <laughs> right. I I can't even imagine anyone thinking that's a good idea. But yeah, uh I, I do like to put a little some, some you know references or goofy ish yeah. things. Um sometimes uh, that Grail Quest series mm-hmm. that was built half on comedy. Um, it's a, it's a f- funny book in its own right. Not even just funny for a game book because you know, we, I think a lot of us, myself included, are probably um, game designers first and writers second. Uh, it, they're very well written books, and I like his bits of humor. So. Uh, you know, I'll put that in there. Uh, it might be a little bit of a spoiler for the upcoming book, but one of the encounters may be two goblins in a trench coat pretending to be a human kid. Mm-hmm. Um, just because I, I don't know, I like funny things sometimes. Yeah. Um, plus. If I'm not if I'm not mistaken, did, isn't isn't something like Death Trap Dungeon just full of um a very British humor? Yeah, yeah. Oh, and there I I like British humor, mm-hmm. and I like that that whole style. It feels very homey to me. Yeah. Um. Also, also when I should note that when I looked at the um art, when I looked at the art on the Kickstarter page for the for the Iron Uprising. Um, specifically the specifically the whole band. I um, I will admit I chuckled a bit seeing a seeing a full on hurdy gurdy in the in the um art because that's one of those instruments that. Well, I've I've called the instrument the be- the the best instrument with the worst name. <laughs> yes, I I love hurdy gurdy music. Um, mm-hmm. the goblin I specifically asked for it to have a mohawk. Um, <laughs> you know I like. I want it to feel like punk. Uh, And yes, what else would dwarfs... Every dwarf band would have to have a hurdy-gurdy player. I don't see how... I mean, they would just have to. Yeah, I can... I can can definitely... I can see... I can see either... Dwarves or some or some... Or some non-D&D versions of of Dark Elves... Doing it. Um... Or, e- or even even some bards who decided to dip into a little bit of cleric, because the because hurdy gurdies were used in ch- in um in ch- in masses um at one point. Yeah, Most, mostly because that. not every church could afford a pipe organ. But I, I uh, hurdy gurdy, it's a it's a you know it's like a string, it's a keyboard, it's a uh, percussion instrument. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, you said bards. So speaking of the um, the the female mm-hmm. is uh, that's actually supposed to be Maraid, one of the possible companions in Stormwing, mm-hmm. on tour with the band. And if you follow, you sound like you'd be familiar with it, but it's kind of a kind of a esoteric style of music mm-hmm. european operatic metal yeah <laughs> i'm okay. very, um the term i the term i often hear used in is um symphonic metal yeah um, but i know but i know exactly where you're going with that so you know how um nightwish can't hold on to a singer yeah yeah that gets called out <laughs> <laughs> she she is that band's um third female singer that they've gone through in a year <laughs> and that's just a, my little night wish you know I, I i would i would i would roast that harder except for the fact that i um i was i was i was there with some of with some of the drama that happened with a with a throwback metal band called white wizard and how in the span of in a span of less than five years they went through 11 former members <laughs> Wow, <laughs> what that's nuts! Yeah, and that, 
then when I then when I looked when I looked on when I when I decided to look on Blabbermouth and Metal Injection to figure out why I ended up finding a goddamn minefield. Oh yeah, but it's. Have you ever heard the expression "when elephants fight, it's the ground that suffers"? I haven't, but it's now my <laughs> new favorite expression. <laughs> that That's was three. That's Babylon Five, man. <laughs> Look. There's, pl- there's, there are, pl- there are plenty of characters I've, I've enjoyed, I've enjoyed with Babylon Five, including the fact that one of them you can, you, you can look at his hair and, de- and use it like the, uh, like, like rings on a tree to determine what season you're watching. <laughs> um, but I, w- I will, I will admit that the. Look, when I when I needed a well dressed vi- when I needed to do a well dressed villain voice, I will freely admit I stole some speaking cues from Mister Morden. He's my favorite villain, <laughs> one of my absolute favorite villains ever. And both, I I stole some cues from both him and from the Inquisitor. Mm, great, great episode. And whenever whenever I've done discussions on. On, hu- on human behavior, I have referenced the whole, the whole question that the Inquisitor keeps asking, um, and driving people up a wall when they don't give me the right answer. But when it when it comes now, what I do find interesting is that you you've you're when it comes to the Iron Uprising, even even with even with the fantastical underpinnings. You were saying you were saying that you were leaning um, towards cyberpunk. Yeah. Now, I. It's funny. It's funny to bring that up in, in my given um, given what I've been doing for the last month because it wasn't too long ago that I held that I held a um, panel doing a deep dive with a few people on on cyberpunk and where and where it's going. Um. And in and in the vein of that. When it com- when it comes to when it com- when it comes to when it comes to doing cyberpunk and what and what could be seen as fantasy underpinnings, um, how did you, what what was the inspiration to go that route and and how did you go about it? Uh, well, I wanted to make a Mega Man book. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> Cyberpunk, I, I just, it, you know, I've liked that since I was a kid in the '80s, and I wanted to do something with it, but I still wanted to stay in, in this world a bit. Um, and you know, the first, the first book, Stormwing, it takes a lot of story from Mandalorian, mm-hmm. um, so it's already got a bunch of sci-fi inspiration. Uh, but cyberpunk, it's just something that it's it's always topical, really. Yeah. But as, especially as we get, you know, really further down this wild ride that <laughs> society is taking, um, you know, fractured geopolitical, cultural, everything. Mm-hmm. That I wanted a, a hero who's kind of kind of like that. Um, you know, I won't spoil the whole story, but it starts out with, um, and this isn't the first five six sections where mm-hmm. you're a you're actually just a civil servant who happened to run across the wrong paperwork in town hall and noticed that the the people from Hang on, we'll get him back in a sec. I kind of thought that it'd be interesting to explore that f- through a fantasy lens. And then, too, um, I started writing this before that big or most recent orcs are racist uh, topic came up on Twitter. But mm-hmm. I wanted something that would show, uh, and I, th- I thought dwarves were great for it, mm-hmm. uh, kind of like a multicultural 
metropolitan or cosmopolitan city. So you've got, you know, dwarves and gnomes and orcs and goblins. There's a minotaur, uh, constructs, some humans. Everyone's just kind of in this city, and it's not like, you know, kill an orc on sight. Um, just because it, it, it would feel more like the real world. So that's just kind of what I want to explore. And I thought dwarves have the big cities. Dwarves, I can hide them away in a mountain with, you know, their setting breaking technology because <laughs> uh, there's cars and motorcycles and airships under the mountain. It's a big cavern. Um, so that's just kind of why, why I made those choices. Yeah, I can def I can definitely um I can definitely go with that. Now you now you now first off, congratulations on ma on managing to managing to get very far pa very far past your goal even after a few di even after a few days in cuz I think you only, I think you did I think you only did this did the um did the opening part of the Kickstarter um like what, 6 days ago? Uh <laughs> Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday. Four days. Four days. Um, yeah. And it's and it's already it's already it's already well past the initial five hundred that you asked for. Um, right. And I'm get I'm guess would it be would it be fair of me to guess that a, that the majority of the um of the fundraising is is for getting more art. So uh, it did a lot better than I expected, yeah. um, and so I was, I pretty much reinvested all mm -hmm. that into the game line, um, and I was able to like as you you know you can see on the Kickstarter page I've already got a lot of art from it. Mm -hmm. um, I really only need a cover and and a few more internal pieces uh, to go. I'd love to hit the same numbers as last time. So then I could set up the next book, um, which actually I did get some, some work done on book three from campaign from the first campaign too, mm -hmm. just so that I'd be able to have some, something to show people. All right, that makes sense. Um, now I know, I know you've got it set up that, it, that the goal is on, um, no, on, Friday on Friday the thirteenth. Um, <laughs> oh. I hadn't noticed. Uh, yeah, I yeah I I look I looked at that I looked at that date on the page and I just realized. Um, stay away from lakes when you finish up. Just oh, say. Right. And the only reason I say that is because some is because some evil pranksters last year put a life size statue of of Jason at the bottom of a at the bottom of a lake in Minnesota. I've seen that, and I'm not okay with it. <laughs> I really don't like that. I um, on on one on one hand that is evil. On the on the other hand, I can't help but I can't help but appreciate the work that went into doing that. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I I do appreciate that as well. I think. Um, I mean, I respect it. Mm -hmm. Like the people, you know, who are putting a, a statue of Robocop in Detroit. You know, it, it might seem tacky, but you respect the work that goes into it. Yeah. Um and I uh, and um and to be and to be fair, I've I've been to art museums so um I've seen worse. Yeah. Like that fr like that friggin' toilet that cl that claimed it was art. Oh yeah. Or or some of the or some of the really pretentious attempts at performance art that I've seen over the last twenty years. Looking at uh, those kind yeah. of things is a good way to give myself some perspective. Um. But what? But um. Give. But would you would you say that you'd pro that you'd probably you'd probably have the. Given the st given the status of the writing, do you suppose that 
you're shoot that you're shooting for a January um window. I'm hoping to have it out before January. I'm thinking I'm going to have the the manuscript ready to go before the campaign ends. Mm -hmm. um, so the the cover this time is going to be done by uh, Matt Bula Howe, who did the character iconics. Mm -hmm. um, I've worked with Matt for years now, and he is an ungodly fast machine when it comes to making art. Uh, so he he could probably get it whipped up. You know, Kickstarter gives you your money two weeks after the campaign ends. Mm -hmm. And then for what I need, three or four pieces plus a cover, that probably wouldn't take him three weeks and so oh yeah 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 middle of december uh for the pdf probably and then yeah i probably early january for the print yeah i i figured it i figured it might take a bit longer since you're dealing with a bigger page count this time yeah um yeah but it it, it might, yeah, take that take that into consideration. It probably probably early January for everything to be ready, and then I'm gonna try and by that time have book three written and ready to go. The funding cycle on this one is it's a little bit slower than it was last time, and I've actually had people approach me and tell me that you know they've got Christmas shopping to do and holiday bills. It's like. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, so, you know, this this campaign, since it's at the end of the year, might uh, might not reach the same level as the last one, but it's still going swimmingly. Mm -hmm. And now to, now to make sure that we don't end up tempting the gods of irony. There we go. Okay. Um, I'm just, say, just saying... Just no, saying... Um, it's important not to jinx things. Cuz I've right. I've seen I've look, I've seen I've seen what happens whenever whenever somebody says how whenever somebody says how bad could it be or says good luck. And then yeah, it's just get slapped back in their face. Yeah. And as somebody who's done a whole lot of dice rolling in and throughout throughout your career, you should be more you should be more than familiar with all the superstitions that people have about dice. Yes. Whether whether it be cursed dice or the whole don't roll someone else's don't roll someone else's die. Yeah, why would you do that? <laughs> um. Especially especially when it's especially when it's so easy to get a pound get a pound of dice, so then you never have to worry about that problem again. Yeah. Um. But but I'll I'll definitely be keeping an eye out for for that, and I'll be and I'll look forward to see, to seeing what to seeing its um release, especially especially since the idea, especially since um hey if I if I do a if I do a stream of of playing the Iron Uprising maybe I can get away with playing um, Mega Man remix music throughout the whole stream. <laughs> oh, that that would actually be pretty cool. <laughs> Yeah, I'd, I'd um, and there and there's plenty of people who've done cover works of di of different themes, so I'm pretty sure I could get away with a fair amount. Yeah, and, I think. You could. And if Capcom gets mad at me, all, I, all I'd have to say is, "Well, you can't. Well, I don't monetize my channel, so there's nothing you can do." And, but with the, with that said, I do want to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule and braving the hell of time zones to come all the way up to the temple. Thank you. And anytime you see fit to return, the door is always open. As I often say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. <laughs> it's it's been fun. Mm -hmm. And of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everybody who took the time out of their schedule to enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here, on the open bar of the internet. 
But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay fucking frosty everybody!